you're listening to the Inquisitive Red Podcast, the show that brings you philosophical ponderings of your life from a bird's eye view. Now, here's your host, Shah. Zandra Haas is a psychotherapist, ordained minister, and psychic medium living in Colorado. She has a podcast called Soul Essence, where she talks about helping others to discover their magical healing. She's also trained in past life regression. Zondra offers sessions to those who wish to explore their intuition, their psychic abilities, and to find how they can hone their gifts and skills. In this interview, we talk about her work and, as always, we bring in philosophy, psychology, and we talk a lot about mediumship and how others can help themselves. We've also very surprisingly and joyfully talked about some of our experiences uh, working as mediums and our experiences in uh, dealing with spirit. So I'm really pleased to welcome her. What a beautiful light energy she is. Zandra Halls, welcome to the Inquisitive Wren. Zandra, thank you so much for joining me today. It's really good to see you. It's so good to see you too. Thank you for having me on your show, Shaw. <laughs> my pleasure. My pleasure. So you do a lot of things. You've got a lot of hats. You, you're a medium. You're also a psychotherapist. You run workshops. But I just want to go back just a little bit to um, how you knew you were a medium. How do, and, and also what came first, the mediumship? Did you study psychotherapy first? How did it all unfold for you? Yeah. Good question. I think, I think of mediumship and maybe this is really like technological <laughs> in terms of our society, but I think of mediumship almost being like a Wi-Fi station, almost like we've got like a Wi-Fi station on our head and it's like, we're tuning into different frequencies in a way. And mediumship for me started really young where it always felt like I could tune into certain things. And we also had a household where there were beings around the house, doors would slam, TVs would turn on, stuff would move around my room, you know, kind of thing. So it was really hard not to kind of try to tune into those things because you're like, I just watched TV and then my bedroom door slammed. I'm the only one home, <laughs> right? Wow. Like kind of that energy. So I was always very kind of overwhelmed and empathic as a kid. And so it took a while. My journey has been a lot of healing the fear mm -hmm. that's come with it because things were always trying to talk to me, but I didn't necessarily know how to sit with it and say, it's going to be okay. And to really listen to it, I could tune into a lot of frequencies and a lot of folks really wanted to be crossed mm -hmm. early on when I was younger. And so I didn't know how to do that. But one of my earliest memories, even when I was like, Oh my gosh, like in second or third grade, I remember having a sleepover with people and being like, let's do a seance. Like, so for some reason early on, I was really into talking to things and they were really into talking to me. Um, but I didn't actually have a really clear way of understanding what was going on. So it came in really, really early. And so my journey has been a lot about clearing out the channel so I can hear clearly, truly. Ah, yeah. so you mentioned yeah. hearing. So obviously you're clairaudient. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. What are the, of the clairs? What, what are the clairs are you, or do you have? I wish I knew all the clairs totally perfectly because there's clairaudient, clairvoyant, clairsentient. Yes, clair... the main ones. Those are the main ones. So the main ones. do you sense and feel? Definitely sense and feel. Definitely when someone's presence comes in, my hair stands up right on the body and I can hear really easily. Even as a kid, I could hear footsteps. I could hear whispers. I could hear all of that kind of stuff. Yeah. So footsteps are something I hear really, really easily for some reason. And I can communicate pretty easily in terms of just having the information drop in, just like you're talking with someone back and forth. It feels kind of telepathic in that mm -hmm. kind of way too. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't have the one with taste. I've been so fascinated. Someone was telling me they can taste things that they're going to eat during the day and stuff like that. And I was like, wow, that sounds really cool in terms yeah. of that piece. But yeah, don't have that one. Um, yeah. Okay. Interesting. I've just recorded a podcast on all the Claire's. So that'll be oh, out soon. Okay. Oh, yeah, it, because it's interesting, isn't it? Some psychics, some mediums have all of them and some just have a few and we don't know why. It's just one of those things, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, 
I'm a kind of a big believer in past lives in a way uh-huh. that our energy is not necessarily created or destroyed. So right. when I started some things I've needed more training on and some things just seem to be there too. Yeah. So I always, I guess I hold a perspective in a way, a little bit of a Buddhist perspective in terms mm. of reincarnation and stuff, but I always get curious around, maybe it's something I've worked on previously. I don't know if you have that too, where you're like, I don't know why I'm really good at this. I've needed right. no training and other things you're like, wow, we need, we need a little bit of practice here. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> no, you're absolutely right. I completely agree. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. I sort of, I had all of them all at once and it was overwhelming. And I thought, well, why, why am I smelling, seeing, feeling, tasting all this stuff? Yeah. It was overwhelming, but yes, why? So I agree with you. And I've studied Buddhism as well. I love it. I'm really aligned with that philosophy. So yes, absolutely. Certainly past lives. I'm a past life practitioner. So let's talk about psychotherapy for a moment. Uh, so were you a medium for because as a child? So you knew something was going on, but then how did you become interested in training as a psychotherapist? Well, I think you probably, I feel, I haven't met someone who's a psychic or a medium that doesn't identify as an empath, right? There's this deep loving, wanting to care, really seeing people at a deep level. So of course, kind of growing up with that heart centered piece, I'm like, how do I help people? Right. And how does that show up? So mediumship was something at the same time. Let's see here. I think I started doing psychic readings, mediumship, things like that in college. My undergrad when I was studying was in social justice and family social science. So there was this huge desire to be an activist. That was a big thing is I was like, how do we really kind of tease out these systems that are really not working? And then as I flooded myself into that place, I was like, I want to work even more closely with people. I want to really be in a heart to heart place. Instead of working with the system necessarily, I want to work person to person. Mm. And so in the background, all the mediumship and psychic stuff was happening, but I wasn't building a business around it. You know, I'd see auras around people was kind of just for me. And occasionally I would just say it to people. And all the while I was, you know, going to all these conferences (laughs) and trying to learn numerology and all that kind of stuff. But Eventually I decided to get a master's in like a double master's in holistic health studies and social work. So I was like, okay, I can bring that holistic energy in to working with folks. And then a year into that program, I discovered the other master's program that I did. I really like school, like a lot, a lot of learning in here, which was uh, contemplative psychotherapy and Buddhist psychology. So it combined psychotherapy with Buddhist psychology And so I ended up doing a year and just doing a graduate degree in holistic health studies and then moving over and becoming a psychotherapist. But it felt very available because I loved Buddhism so much and because I loved their way of seeing every person as whole. Mm -hmm. And that almost like the mentality that we're all actually really, um, they don't use the word divine. That's the, that's my Mm -hmm. word, but very divine in a way. And all these patterns and things that have gotten the way are kind of like the clouds in front of the sun and how do we help someone see the clouds and also really see their brilliance Mm -hmm. inside and so that really allowed me to open and as I was doing my graduate degree there's a lot of meditation there's meditation retreats required Mm -hmm. meditation teachers it's very important in the program that you really sit with yourself in every single sphere so that you can really authentically sit with others. It's not just informational. You've been to those kind of hard places in yourself and, um, man, doing more and more meditation, it just cracked everything open huge and everything went through the roof. And then I couldn't really just keep it to myself. I couldn't really ignore it anymore and not ignore it necessarily, but it, it was calling to me and I didn't really know. So that's, that's how it all sort of opened. So they sort of paralleled each other mm-hmm. in a way, but one really interwove with the other. Wow. Yeah. So yeah. interesting though. And isn't it, I mean, how do you see that path, that journey? How did you, how do you view it is mm-hmm. in terms of weaving your way? You know, they say that things are dropped into our lap. When you talk about the second masters, that mm-hmm. program after doing your first two, How do you view that? How did that all come about? Yeah, I think 
I think we all have different ways of knowing. For a lot of folks, it really sits in the body. And for me, knowing feels like an open door. It just feels like, have you ever spent money and you don't feel like you spent it? You spend it and you're like, it's the lightest money I've ever spent. I don't feel like I did anything. And I think my knowing about what to do when you say dropped in the lap, Mm -hmm. it's like something would come up to me almost, or I would see it or hear someone talk about it. And there would just be that opening. And it was like, oh, here's the next door, right? Here's the next door sort of in a way. And um, I feel a lot of people look at me, especially being in my thirties, doing psychic mediumship. A lot of the folks that are in my field are much, much older than Mm -hmm. I am. It Mm -hmm. feels amazing to have such cool mentors. And they're always like, how did you, how are you doing this right now? And I think it's because really, really early on, it cracked open in a big way. And I had a couple really hard kind of traumatic experiences that caused me to have to really go far into this work really, really early on. And that's why I think it comes through now in a, in a bigger way versus waiting a little bit more. Does that make sense? I don't know if I'm describing that correctly, but it's like the weaving it. I think I was talking to a mentor and she's like, honey, she's like, you just chose to really wake up to it. Like really, really early. She goes, and you also love learning and love people. She's like, so, you know, your whole, your whole thing has been like, how do I help by, um, like they say in shamanism, being the hollow bone, being Mm -hmm. this connection Mm -hmm. channel to just really offering information. And so it just feels like home to do that. I'm sure you feel that too. It just comes through in this beautiful way to offer to Mm -hmm. people, but it's not really us, right? Right. It's just connection or this Wi-Fi channel that is cleaned out enough to hear it. Interesting. So is there a difference then between the way you might uh, read for someone as a medium to Mm -hmm. how you would work psychotherapeutically with someone? It's really, I'm not sure. I know different countries have different protocols, Mm -hmm. but in the U.S., very much so, especially as a psychotherapist in Colorado, Mm -hmm. is that each state has its own licensure and at this current time, I think it'll change someday, but the, uh, the licensing board doesn't believe in psychic mediumship as a modality, of course. So I have an entire psychic medium business. I'm an ordained minister. So that sits under that hat of offering spiritual counseling and psychic work really based on someone's sort of soul wanting and really wanting to develop psychic abilities Mm. versus psychotherapy has a lot more to do with helping something really through different traumas, different energies that are sometimes stuck in the body, Mm. mental health, certain more diagnostic. So if someone comes to me, sometimes people are like, I want to work with you. And we sit down and we say, do you feel resourced, right? In your normal life? Do you have tools? Are there certain symptoms? And we really look through because psychic mediumship oftentimes is we're giving people the answer. And in psychotherapy, we're helping people, as you know, find their own answer. And so I would never in a psychotherapy meeting bring that kind of direction in because we want them to trust themselves. So depending on someone's history, medications, things like that, I have had folks start out in psychotherapy Mm -hmm. and eventually when they're resourced enough, if they want to learn those skills that are more psychic based, we'll talk about what that would be like to move into a different business model and have different paperwork and things like that. But um, we're not at a place in our society where we can um, weave those things necessarily in a way, I think a lot of psychotherapists I know are turning into coaches so that they can do that work, but that's very um, edgy, I would say, in Colorado to do that just because of the licensing board and the really particular protocol around it. And also depends, I think you know this too, of course, who you're working with, depending on what someone's working with, certain diagnoses are way more, um, need way more resourcing mm-hmm. than others versus someone that maybe has just more neurotic things that they're working with or um, more just emotion-based support and trauma versus some of these higher diagnoses that need a lot more management. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Absolutely. Yeah. So there is that difference. Yes. In the UK, certainly they haven't integrated as such. Um, The holistic part is integrating more here. I mean, but it hasn't gone to that. As you say, it hasn't integrated. I don't know if it ever will just because psychism isn't science-based or proven just yet although I disagree with all that but anyway that's a whole different story (laughs) Um, I I found this quote from 
Abraham Maslow, and I wanted to ask your thoughts about it. Um, he said, what is necessary to change a person is to change his awareness of himself. Mm -hmm. And I like that because it does put the earnest on the person. Mm -hmm. As you were saying, our role in psychotherapy is really for them to work mm -hmm. out what's going on for them. It's helpful if a person gets to know themselves rather than, well, mm -hmm. I believe, then we giving them all the answers. We sort of help them, depending on how you were trained psychotherapeutically. But what mm -hmm. are your thoughts about Maslow's quote? Mm -hmm. I love that you picked it out. It's It's got a Buddhist vibe to it, of course. Mm -hmm. So there's, a, <laughs> with the mindfulness piece yeah. is what I hear him yeah. hear saying is the more we can be aware of our thoughts and what we're doing throughout the day, almost like creating that second watch mm -hmm. kind of person or that second self, that higher yeah. self, some people say to watch. I think the more freedom we have rather than just going about in our normal programming, right? The day-to-day -day kind of, first person experience can we have a first person and a third person so that we can watch and say do i like that am i am i creating more for myself or creating less by these things so yeah i love that piece it seems across the board i haven't heard anyone ever say that having more awareness in a way doesn't allow us to shift things. I do sometimes in psychotherapy see folks that know they like, they have the knowledge, but they don't know how to actually practice it sort of in a way. So I've seen where almost too much knowledge, you can kind of bypass the experience yeah. sort of in a way. Absolutely. But in general, I would say that awareness and really um, bringing compassion with awareness feels important mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. I think in a way, just because a lot of folks will sometimes watch what they do. And then the second they see it, they go, oh, that's bad. Oh, I judge right. that. Right? Or right. there's some way to bring shame or guilt. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not enough or what I did is not enough. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it seems like the first point or the first sort of wheel in a way is developing the awareness. And then as you develop the awareness, how do you bring love to that space and go, whew, like I did this again, bringing a little bit of amusement or play or not mm -hmm. getting so down on the self. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't seem that shame or guilt really ever allow us to transform mm -hmm. in a fast way. Yeah. Yeah. Shame and guilt. Well, that's a whole huge topic we could do a podcast on. <laughs> yeah. It's big, isn't it? Um, mm -hmm. You know, I often, I often say that I'm a born skeptic, but I wanted to know your thoughts on skepticism and mediumship um it's something i'm asking all the mediums that i interview as well because it's something that i think we deal with maybe not personally i mean i've never had somebody mm -hmm. confront me as such to say oh you're not a me or you i've never had that um but you know i just wonder what your thoughts because there's a lot of people who set out to prove us either wrong or uh i saw a, a video the other day talking about mediumship as being a scam uh mm -hmm. you know there's a lot out there so mm -hmm. what are your thoughts on skepticism yeah i like your you're like i'm a born skeptic and i, <laughs> I am i think it's well okay how do i i'm like how do i say this in like a minute because there's so many pieces to it well, take your time. Right. I'm so I think sometimes of skepticism being paired with realism in some sort of way. Like to be skeptical is to sort of be focused more on a realism piece or what I can see with my eyes, or even more maybe of a left brain or like a science sort of piece. Mm -hmm. But I also think it's fascinating that like the more like the higher levels of science have equations and are starting to have equations for how mediumship actually works. Like I had a, a dear friend who's a psychotherapist, but she just loves physics. And so she messaged me the other day and goes, oh my God, this quantum physics video literally explains how you do what you do. And she sent it to me. And so it's, it's interesting because it feels like the higher levels of science really challenge 
is our reality real, right? Like you think about how, you know, butterflies and bees can only see ultraviolet light and we can't. So if we were to take a realism perspective and someone were to say, oh, I see this beautiful purple light and someone goes, well, I'm skeptical, I don't see that. Well, it's like, what's your perception though? You know, your reality, how much can you actually see? So I think there's a healthy skepticism that can be there around protecting yourself. I feel like that's what skepticism is. It's how do I protect myself from taking in information in some way, but I'm also like, well, do you have to protect yourself for certain things? You know, I think it's, it's, there's something about like, if you believe in something that's not real, you're gullible and you're weak, you know, like that's why we can go down the rabbit hole kind of with it, where that like idea of skepticism comes from this sense of keeping yourself safe. And I, again, bringing in the Buddhist here, but Mm -hmm. There's something really big that I feels important of when some information comes in, how do we be neutral to it Mm -hmm. and really connect in with it in ourself and say, huh, does that help me in some sort of way? Does that give me new information or is it just information and I can just have it be there and I don't necessarily have to fight it in some sort of way. I imagine I've been in a space where someone in a mediumship role is trying to push a belief system on me and I can feel like, oh, they're feeling mm. something and they really need validation for this, mm-hmm. right? And that's not actually mine to take on. That's something they work on on themselves yeah. in a way there too. So I went in a lot of different directions with that, but I think healthy skepticism and boundaries are good around information. But if we take the perspective to be skeptical that it's not real because we can't see it, our higher levels of science are proving that theory wrong. So you can't necessarily say if you're a skeptic, you're aligned in science, <laughs> I guess is what I Excellent would say. Excellent point. Oh, that is so lovely the way you've explained that. And it's steeped in science, really. You gave a lot of science in there. And physics is proving, I agree with your friend there, is starting to prove... One thing I've always said, and people haven't, I was on a TV show once, and it's called Kilroy. It was a show here in the UK, and it was about hypnotherapy and psychics and everything. And I said to the audience, look, we all, we, all we have is the human brain to understand the human brain. We only have the human mind to understand the human mind. Mm-hmm. And people were like, what, what? <laughs> and then all of a sudden people started clapping. It took them a moment, but they got it. And mm-hmm. I think like something you alluded to, I was thinking, yes, how do, when you said, how does it help me? Does this help me? I was thinking, yes. And could mm-hmm. it be true? That's mm-hmm. the other question we could ask people. Could that be true? Could that yeah. be Violet Ray? Could that be, could we possibly hear angels singing? Why is it, as you, your example about animals and insects, would they hear? Yeah, so I think I agree. If we could open our minds just a bit more, Mm -hmm. it may help us to evolve because Mm -hmm. that's what we're meant to be doing, evolving. Never miss a show by clicking the subscribe button right now. Thank you for your support. You make this podcast possible. Now, back to the show. So we're just going to go philosophically since we're kind of talking about physics, but we're going to go philosophy for a moment. Have you ever had to fly above anything? Hmm. Well, I think it, yes, I think it pairs with um, like the skepticism. I think you and I, maybe you said I'm a born skeptic, but I think I've had my chapters of that as well. Mm -hmm. And a big theme, especially, um, especially doing a lot of the work that I do is to doubt the doubt. A lot of the flying over has been doubting doubt Mm -hmm. because just because you're a medium or a psychic or any of those things doesn't mean you don't have doubt come up in a way, but it is this constant constant experience of letting go of ego over and over so that you can actually get it out of the way. And it takes a lot of practice to do that. Mm -hmm. It takes, and that's where meditation, that's why so many spiritual teachers will say meditate because you're practicing getting things out of the way. So you can see clearly, right. Which is what clairvoyance means clean seeing clearly. Right. So it's, there's a sense for me, a lot of the flying over piece, the spiritual warrior's journey is to doubt the doubt. And so for me, 
each chapter of the way, just because growing up so early with this awareness, there was a lot of doubt and a lot of fear, and there was no one around me really to mirror and say, oh, I hear the footsteps too. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of questioning and a lot of doubt in a way. And so ego likes to come in and fill in, you know, um, uh, sometimes I like to think of the brain, like the Google search, it, it doesn't necessarily find the nicest answers. So if you've told yourself a million times that you're wrong and you hear something in you, you know, you say, oh, is that right? And your brain comes up with, well, it's wrong because you've thought that a million times, right? The Google search just comes up with how many times you've thought something that's the answer to it. Yeah. And so for me, it's been a lot of programming and letting go of doubt because so much of this work for me was very fear-based mm-hmm. at first because Um, there was no, let's see here. There was no validation for it. Like I, my mom was really lovely and brought us to eventually when I was a teenager, she brought me to like a psychic coach, um, person, but she reached out to the woman. I still remember her writing the email and her email was like, help. I have a child from the sixth sense and I don't know what to do. (laughs) Sort of thing. That was her first sort of email in a way. So I feel for her. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. I don't, I, I can't even imagine being a parent and having a yes. kid tuned into those things and not knowing how to protect them or yeah. not yeah. having a map for how to help them open those things up in a way too. So my flying over has been lifelong, but it's been doubting the doubt and really mm. finding more and more kind of compassionate neutrality because that seems to also put boundaries down around what I can tap into. I didn't realize as a kid, as a medium, you can tap into lots of different frequencies. Um, And so it also helped me understand, really tune my Wi-Fi station for what I want to tap into Mm. as well. I like that. Yes. Tune in the Wi-Fi station. Absolutely. So Mm -hmm. have you ever had any frightening experiences? Most of them beginning were frightening. They were very, um, like I was the kid that had to sleep with a nightlight on because I would hear footsteps down the hallway and I'd wake up and I'd be staring and I needed a light to like, look at the door because again, the brain keeps trying to say there's nothing there. Yes. And yet spidey senses say there is. So there's this constant internal battle. Um, when I was in when I was seven, eight, nine, I can't even remember when it stopped. Really. I used to apologize to people all the time because I'd be sitting next to them in a classroom and we'd get our test scores back. And maybe if they didn't do well on the test score, I could just feel this pain or this ache or this shame. And I would look at them and thought I did something because I was like, Oh no, I impacted them. Or did I not, did I not smile at them? Was I mean? And so I would look at people and say like, I'm sorry. And people would be really confused because I didn't know, I didn't have a lot of good boundaries. So a lot of my experiences were really enmeshing in energy and not understanding what was mine. Mm -hmm. And so I did have some really, um, even when I was younger, like 12 or 13 area, I actually had a spirit really invade my space Mm -hmm. in a way. Um, there's, I, I talked about it on a different podcast. It was something I was shameful for, for a while, but most people have these experiences now. So sometimes I speak to them, but definitely had an experience where, um, I had a spirit very, very early in the morning. I was reading a book again. There's a nerdy theme here. I'm pretty into the learning and the nerdy, but I was, um, yeah, I had a book out in front of me and I was reading at like two in the morning and the book just started vibrating and there were cell phones already at that time. I had a cell phone really early on, like as a fifth grader. (laughs) And so I was like, I looked at the book and I was like, oh, there's a cell phone, right? It's someone texted me. I don't know why someone would do that. And I lifted the book up and there was nothing there. And I looked over at the table and my cell phone was over there and I was holding the book because of course the ego is like, that doesn't happen, right? And all of a sudden, just like a wind, the pages flew up and started doing this. And then my body slumped backwards and there was a woman talking to me through Mm. my mindset and she was trying to tell me her name and kind of took over mediumship wise. And I honestly, I'm so grateful for the experience because I, years later, I was thinking about on it and I just kept saying to her over and over, I'm not ready over and over and over, not get out, not whatever. Mm -hmm. I just said to her, I'm not ready. And so there was something in me that already Mm -hmm. knew that was coming, that knew that connection point was coming, but again, was working on boundaries a lot with beings. I think, um, I sort of think of us in a way people that can see and feel and talk with the other side is kind of like a lighthouse. People are Mm. like, Oh, 
this is a way to communicate. And I think I was just a lighthouse growing up. And so things would come over to me and try to communicate. And so um, I was fearful of those things, but now, and I don't know, Shaw, if you um, experience this as well, but I'm so grateful for my psychotherapy skills because when beings come in, sometimes we have like a really big talk where mm-hmm. they're, they really need to be crossed and they're like, I'm so ashamed. I don't feel like I deserve to. And so I actually use those skills to help people cross mm-hmm. now in a way too. So I have boundaries now. I have like a sign on my front psychic door that says come back at a different time rather than feeling invaded um, by that energy. But my experience was doubting the doubt and the shame that I couldn't turn those things off early on. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. You've had some really interesting experiences, but isn't it? Yeah. You had the earnest, you knew to say, I'm not ready. Yeah. You knew to say that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I find that fascinating. Mm-hmm. So there was something in you that just knew. And, and I'm wondering too, and again, you can decide how much you want to say, Shaw, but how did you decide boundaries for you, right? With some of this information, like, did you, were you always really good at boundaries, right? Or was it overwhelming and you had to put those in? It's, I don't hear a lot of people, get, especially that have psychic abilities early mm-hmm. on, have been really good at boundaries. So we Absolutely. all have our journey with it, You're but right. I'm curious, mine was a big experience. I don't know if you've had all that practice too, around deciding when things come in as well. Yeah. No, you're absolutely right. So for me, early on, it was all coming in. And I don't know if it was my Catholicism, because I was raised Catholic, where I would just pray to the angels and say, stop it, let them make them stop, make them stop. And then they just stop. So I've carried that through. And then when I did some my mediumship training, with a beautiful soul, Ruth, she's now passed on South African lady. Mm -hmm. Uh, she sort of showed me how to put up boundaries quicker Mm -hmm. and faster and easier. And now I just don't allow them in. I just don't allow them in. I don't want to, I'm not interested, (laughs) Mm -hmm. but yeah, if if I'm doing a mediumship, then the person in front of me, that's who I want. I want the energies to come through, to talk to the person in front of me. Random spirits, I'm not into, I'm not interested. Mm-hmm. But you, you, as you say, sometimes they can get in. I think if you're not, and this is our, this is why as mediums out there, listeners, viewers, if you're watching this as well, if you're going to train for mediumship, as Sandra's talking about here, boundaries are really important. Mm-hmm. And it's important that you learn to continue to do the work and protect yourself morning, afternoon, evening, before reading, after reading. And that protects your energy so that, you know, literally a, a spirit will see a shield up in front of you where they can't get near you. Mm-hmm. Um, that kind of thing. So I think we have to, the, it's a long answer, but I think we have to continue to work at it is what my, sorry, is what my answer is. I have to continue every day to keep a boundary up because mm-hmm. I'm really, I don't have time to speak to random spirits. Um, I don't want them around me. I don't want them near me. It, mm-hmm. Unless they've got a message for me, then fine, give it to me somehow. But mm-hmm. other than that, but again, let me say this, viewers, listeners, what Sandra, what Sandra's talking about, you've got a gift for that. So you, we're all different. Mm-hmm. I'm not interested in these random spirits, but other mediums may entertain them. And you clearly have a gift to help them to pass on, pass over, pass through, whatever they need. You've Mm -hmm. been gifted with that to help them. Let them go to people who are born to help them in that way. And you clearly are. One other thing I want to say to you, I think I want, have you thought about trance mediumship? Because I think that's what you, what was happening for you with the book, with with that incident. Yeah, I am trained in trans mediumship. Ah, as well. I okay. am. And I don't, 
I did. Um, there's a really amazing um, psychic center near where I live in Boulder, Colorado, and I've spent years and years and years doing all their different programs. And they have like a five year trans medium one. And I've done five little over years. There. Yeah. It's, you go what up to all- do? What are they doing in five years? <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of um, it's it, it's a lot of practicing beings coming in and holding different frequencies and they their higher levels are like ectoplasm and all of that kind of yeah excellent excellent yeah so I have done it and I and I do it for myself um I do psychic fairs sometimes Mm. we'll do oh man I'll do like 60 readings in a weekend yes little 20 minute ones and I I miss those yeah yeah (laughs) Some, I'm starting to get on the edge where I'm like, okay, like, can I keep doing them? I'm starting to like, mm-hmm. starting to feel a little taking a break from them a little bit, but before and after them, I will always do trans mediumship. And there's certain beings that I work with that come in for me. And I just haven't really offered it to other people to let folks come through. I do have people email me about it and I usually send them to other mm-hmm. folks just because I think it's something to even do the trans mediumship program. I had to work with all the fear, right? Cause my yes. first really big experience was having a being with no boundaries really mm. in my space. So to say, I trust a being enough to really get out of the way to let it move through. Mm-hmm. I was able to do it and did it for about a year. And the healing is just amazing mm. sort of for it. I have a sense that it might come around later in a way here too, mm. but I'm my right now, it seems to be helping more of the empaths in a way, get their like, abilities up is kind of my major focus. Yes. You, when you were just talking about your experience about with the book that felt for me, like it was a trance meet that you spontaneous is the word I'm looking at. Spontaneously, you yeah. were about to just be a spirit was going to take over, which was what happens in trance. Yeah. yeah. Interesting you. stuff. I love it. I love trans mediumship. I trained with a guy here called Tony Stockwell, who's quite well known. Uh, he's brilliant. Uh, he teaches at the College of Psychic Studies here in London. Um, I love it. But like you, I, I, I'm kind of not offering it I, to, to randomly say, yes, come. I, I will just allow spirits to come in and take over. Mm, not, not right now. <laughs> in the future it's a lot of energy it's It's so draining oh my goodness so so draining Mm -hmm. interesting okay so frightening experiences yes um if you'd like to be a guest on the show email us at inquire at the inquisitive rin.com that's e-n-q-u-i-r-e at the inquisitive rin.com be sure to check all social media especially the facebook page for new topics being discussed. And if you can contribute, please let us know so you can be a guest on the show. Now back to the show. So, you know, you talked about past life a little bit. So Mm -hmm. if you could go back in time, you know, any decade, any time, or it could be the present, I don't know. Would you, is there a decade that stands out for you that you'd like to maybe see what it was like? There, I don't know if you've ever seen this film. I think it's from the 80s, maybe, but it's called Goddess Remembered. It has like Starhawk and a few other really, really amazing. Oh, I need to write that. Goddess Remember. Yeah. It's, okay. I think, I think it's on YouTube for free, actually. It's got a okay. few different parts of it. I'll um, look it up. Yeah. It's from the 80s, and there's a lot of really amazing women from all over the world, a lot of different traditions. And they talk about the different parts of history, some that are really not written down, especially around when divine feminine energy was a lot more intertwined on this planet. So talking thousands of years ago, 5,000, 10,000 years ago, when folks were living in a more um, tribal kind of connected interwoven cultural sort of space. And there was a lot more because there was a lot more divine feminine happening in the world, there was a lot more sharing. There was a lot more resourcefulness, a lot more of ritual and sacredness and things like that. And they talk about when a big shift with more patriarchal societies came in, more wars came in. And 
Um, so I've always really been drawn to those spaces where there was a lot more peace. And I think there's always been fighting over resources, even in, yeah. you know, peaceful times, not that everything was just hunky dory, you know, yeah. all the time, but I would love to go back to, um, some of the ancient spaces. Like they talk about Mala being a very, very well-known, amazing city where there were temples and rituals and things like that. And they do talk about in some of these other societies, like women in the cycle were really revered versus right now it's a shame Mm -hmm. sort of space. Um, the womb is sort of a shameful space. And so kind of projected on, in our society in a lot of ways. And, um, there they talk about how just being able to be in a body and honor its cycles and male and female, um, Mm -hmm to have times like that, I think would be really healing. And Mm -hmm. so I can feel those spaces and I can feel myself in different societies. I almost, sometimes I talk to my future self a lot. My future self is a spirit guide. Like a lot of people want to connect in with their Mm -hmm. spirit guides and I have a lot, but a big one for me is me in the future and me now I often send energy backwards to me into past lives. If there's like a an ache. A lot of times if I'm healing, I'll ask a healing or a guide, can you bring this energy back so that I can heal all my selves and all the different pieces sort of in a way. Um, so yeah, that's sort of where I think I would want to go. I think there'd be a lot of medicine to bring back in the now and a lot of really ancient rituals and texts and sort of, um, just, life force practices that are really missing from now. And I think we all feel a sense that something's missing. There's that ache that Instagram somehow can't seem to fill in a way. (laughs) So I I think we're returning in a way to some of those pieces, but I would love to have um, more awareness and to be able to embody that um, to bring it into the now. Mm. Yeah. 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 Oh, that's beautiful. Uh, when you're talking about your future self being a guy that is so loving so self-caring as well Uh, Mm -hmm. and I I know our listeners will take a lot from that Mm -hmm. Um, when uh, right your podcast that's what I want to go to next because Mm -hmm. you've got this lovely podcast soul essence uh, Mm -hmm. which is a beautiful name really. So why did you choose the, the name? So essence It's the name of your YouTube channel as well, isn't it? And all social media, uh, yeah. by the way, all the links listeners will be in the show notes. So yes. You know, I, there's something even throughout time, the word soul is so ancient in a way, like there's so many different things, even in text, you see the word soul, not always spirit in a good way. Yeah. Like sometimes they'll say spirits, but soul has always been something that seems to reside mm-hmm. in a place, even in, in sort of religious texts, right? Save the soul, something mm-hmm. about the soul being this mm-hmm. highest self sort of piece. And so I love every single breath and meditation is the opportunity to connect in with that soul sort of piece. And I was like, soul, what? Cause the goal is just to help people come back to what's already there. And I was like, soul, what? And, um, my mother is just one of the most brilliant beings. We've shared a lot of lives together. And so whenever I need something, I'm just like, all right, all right, mom, I really, really, as I'm creating this business, want to use soul. And she was like, soul essence. She's like, and I was like, can you do that? Cause essence is soul. And she's like, she's like, I think they just go together. I think they just are. So it's sort of like the soul essence is sort of coming back to this deep medicine in which it's us, right. Drawing that energy, almost like this forgotten energetic imprint of who we actually are. Right. That sort of, and also that collective kind of soul energy, not only the I, but the we and the us Mm. that we're all interconnected as well. So it's almost like soul essence is coming back to that peace that we're often longing for. Most people can relate to that sense of when we're not connected in with our highest self, that loving, true sort of inner peace, we, we try to fill it. Right. And consumeristic society is so ready to make a billboard that goes, you know, that ache you're feeling, man, you put on those Nike right. sneaks, we're going right. to fill that hole for you. Right. Exactly. <laughs> so, 
that's sort of where it comes from was this deep connection I have with my, with my mother. She's pretty psychic too. She wouldn't admit it, but she very much so is more practical psychic where she's like, I think we should go left here. And then we avoid an accident or something like yeah. that, like those sorts of things. She's not doing readings necessarily, but um, yeah, that's sort of where it comes from. It's just helping people click back in to what's already there, sort of just reclaiming in a big way. Yeah. And do you believe that people are guided to you? Or is that too woo-woo for? <laughs> I love your use of the woo-woo. <laughs> I hear, I've heard the expression, so I'm using it today. <laughs> yeah. You know, I sometimes people come up to me and it's just, the, I love feedback of how people find me. Sometimes I'll be at an event and a woman came up and said, you know, she said, my daughter just passed and I had a dream and she gave me your name. And I looked it up and found that you were here. And so I just came here. Incredible. I have people a lot of times through dreams. Mm -hmm. um, one woman found me because she said that she was working through a relational piece with her family. And I was in her dream and was talking about soul contracts with her. So I'm not sure what my soul is doing at night. I don't have memories of doing that, but I don't know how people would just sort of come up and find me. So it feels like some people have this inkling or this knowing, or there's an opening sort of in a way in themselves. Sometimes it's through dreams or else. And I, a lot of the times people find me more so because they're in relationship with someone that they really love or trust. And they, they're like, what's happening for you. And they're like, Oh, I'm working with this person. And they're like, I want to have, I can't tell you how many people they'll read my website. And they're like, I don't know what you're saying, but I want whatever's happening. <laughs> right. Right. And yeah. I'm like, great, let's talk about, let's talk about what's happening or what you would like to happen, right? Or what your yeah. sort of vision is. Cause it's still hard to describe the soul because everyone's soul connection is different, different mm -hmm. colors, different frequencies, different energies. So it's so unique, our soul print yeah. in a yeah. way. Yeah. Yeah. So Excellent. Goals. Yes. And, and, you know, depending on belief systems and this is, I believe this is all about belief systems. It just depends on what you believe out mm -hmm. there. Everybody will believe what they believe, but, uh, you know, people are drawn to you. Sometimes people will say, well, you know, I was just guided to you. And sometimes I will say, well, did you Google psychic? And they'll say, yes, you came up. And I said, well, you actually Googled psychic. <laughs> but they'll say, yes, but anybody could have come up. So it is a belief system. <laughs> this is my born, um, born skeptic, you see. So I... <laughs> I'm I'm a bit of all of it, you know, a walking dichotomy. And it's fun. It's fun to live like this. Yeah. But I do like the woo-woo stuff. So, you know, I'm into crystals. I'm into all that. And being a medium, I think that, and I want to get your take on this, psychology, I think, has a long way to go. So I did see a video, and I'm not going to say names, right? I can't even remember the psychologist's name anyway, but Recently, a, uh, a psychologist on YouTube said, well, people who claim to see and hear spirits are schizophrenic. Mm. Now, I understand what they're saying, because that is a symptom of schizophrenia, although it's everybody with schizophrenia does not hear voices. Yeah. We need to make that clear because I've worked in the field. I know. Uh, but it is a, it's a very common symptom. Mm -hmm. But I disagree with that diagnostic finding. It's, you know, it's in the, the TSM. The, I just don't agree with that because I hear voices. I know I'm not schizophrenic. So I think they've got a long way still to go. I mean, this is 2022 and there's a psychologist saying that. So we've got to open our minds a bit more um around that so I just wanted to get your thoughts on that that's me being judgmental of psychology oh. which I am I can do that <laughs> and I will do that but you don't have to but what are your thoughts about that yeah I think we're very aligned in that psychology is such a young field mm -hmm. and so much of the research clinically starting with was done on very particular bodies and ages and socioeconomic statuses and all that kind of stuff. So just, you know, to take psychology's 
you know, roots and foundation um, was not very ethical to start with to yeah. even, you know, pinning hysteria on women that were trying mm-hmm. to find purpose mm-hmm. in their lives. Oh, you're yes. hysterical. I don't know why you're not happy just doing nothing and being a servant all the time. I don't yes. know why you're not happy. Yeah. <laughs> Weird. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so, yeah. I tend to be skeptical as well. And I, all, in, in those spaces, and I understand, I, um, if you were to diagnostically look through, you know, the DSM and look through all those pieces, I definitely like the, some of the, the sensations that I have and the information that comes in mm-hmm. totally. I'm like, diagnostically, these are a couple <laughs> symptoms of this diagnosis. Right. Right. And I have those experiences. Right. But what I find interesting is that I've also worked with folks diagnostically schizophrenia, schizoaffective, mm-hmm. mm-hmm. some of those same sort of traits. And what's interesting is they're very tapped into the finer energies. Definitely. Definitely tapped in, mm-hmm. but there's a really huge lack of boundaries, super lack of boundaries. And I, I understand I have such deep compassion for how good sometimes tapping into those energies feel like when you, if someone, for instance, if we were to make up a person that maybe is diagnosed with schizophrenia and sometimes folks I've worked with, there's a lot around God mm-hmm. and kind of this ego energy around like, well, I'm Jesus. Mm-hmm. And, you know, but it's because there's this beautiful loving energy that they're feeling that the, the ego goes, oh, this reminds me of Jesus. So mm-hmm. you must be Jesus. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's sometimes it's this ego ownership of those energies rather than seeing yourself as divine and seeing everyone as divine. Yeah. Right. There's this I think ego sometimes tries to own spirituality in terms of schizophrenia and tries to make sense of it and Mm -hmm. tries to create light and dark, good and bad karma, Mm -hmm. um, in a way. And so I personally think that sometimes folks that are really, um, have a lot of that diagnostic criteria are not very in the body. They're not Mm -hmm. really in their skin. Mm -hmm. And so they're really out there tapping into all these energies. And I think it'd be really hard to walk around and not feel safe in your own body Mm. and how the mind tries to make sense of all of that information and those downloads. Most psychics that, I mean, most folks that are schizophrenic I've sat with are very psychic, super, super psychic. Um, They'll point something out and I'll be like, wow, yeah, you totally picked up on that. You know, how did you know? And, but I've also seen a lot of folks with um, schizophrenia also really try to enhance those things. Mm -hmm. They'll drink tons of coffee or stimulants or mm-hmm. take certain substances to keep them up in that space rather yeah. than bringing that ability in the body. And so, yeah. yeah, I think you and I both have those tuned in abilities, but there's a lot of boundaries. There's a lot of care. There's yeah. a lot of compassion and there's a lot of sense of really valuing the body and also valuing this reality mm-hmm. <laughs> as exactly. well exactly. and the matter in this reality versus yeah. just kind of blasting off into the just kind of living in the ethers. It doesn't really work. You can't really be on this planet in a safe way and just live in the ethers. It doesn't really work. Yes. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And I, I also, I will just quickly add to that. I think mm-hmm. that that shows a lot about the person. And I know there's a lot out there about how much we divulge about ourselves and all that. Our mm-hmm. training will have a lot to do with that. My training is usually I'm quite private, that kind of thing. And there's also a lot of misconception, like all therapists, if they help people, that means they've been through it. Well, one of my top things to help with is panic attacks and phobias. I've never had a panic attack. I don't have a phobia. So that theory is out the window. So, you know, all therapists are nightmares or crazy where does that come from? <laughs> oh, you know, yeah. I, yeah, we, we hear so much of the, a therapist needs a therapist. Well, yes, we do have therapists because when we're doing our training, we have to have them. Yeah, <laughs> it's right. different from having a supervisor. We have to have those as well. So people don't understand. I'm saying all this to the point that the psychologist who said psychics are schizophrenic I think that may show a lot about their need to have tick boxes and to control things in that small, tiny space, that tiny little space to lump people into that because they've got an extra sensory perception um, into that tiny 
tiny, 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 because it's tiny little space mm-hmm. of being schizophrenic. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's a shame because that's so tiny. Their world is small. It might be spirit, but I keep getting this tiny, I keep wanting to say the word tiny. Mm-hmm. It's just so small. It's a small mind. It's a small thought. It's a small perception. It's a small idea. It's it's small. The DSM, you know, that's small. There's <laughs> so much smallness about mm-hmm. it. And what I hope for everyone is that we expand, we become bigger, we become more fleshed out, fuller. We expand everything, our awareness, who we are, the space we take up, everything. Our voices, we expand, not shrink. Mm-hmm. So I went on a bit of a tangent there, but <laughs> I, wanna, I always want to ask your, you know, another medium's thoughts about that. Mm-hmm. So I want to ask you as well, just a couple mm-hmm. more questions. Um, I noticed that your website, you combine your practices. You have, you do them separately, but I know you combine them on the site, which I think is brilliant. Mm-hmm. Um, do you, do you find that that has hindered, helped, or there's no difference? People will come to you anyway. You mm-hmm. know, how some people are just looking for a psychotherapist, so they go to a Yeah. Yeah. I think so on my website, I do say that I do psychotherapy on it. And if people are interested, it goes to a different website. So it's got one over there. So they, some people do find me through the psychic work first. Mm -hmm. And as they're reading, they're like, whew, this is something that I really would love, but I really need to work through the deep depression Mm -hmm. that I'm really going through or some of these symptoms that I'm struggling with. And so sometimes when I'm working with folks, they're like, I really want to tap into that higher self and that deeper knowing, Mm -hmm. but it doesn't actually feel aligned for me where I'm at to be able to enhance my psychic abilities Mm. right right now, or that feels, and I'm a big, big believer in the somatic and starting in the body. So even when I teach people psychic abilities, I call the first program, the root medicine, because what we do is we start learning energy work about how do I be in the body in a safe way and learn how to run my energy and move out for an energy, get different boundaries so that as you're opening up those abilities, you have your root system so that sometimes I'll see people try to open up their psychic abilities without the proper roots. And, um, it's too overwhelming. It's too much. Sometimes there'll be mania. There'll be really difficult things that someone will go through. So, I, with my sort of psychic medium program where I work with empaths and opening those spaces, we start with more of a psychology context where we are really learning about body and boundaries and energy channels and things like that. But when someone is coming in and says, man, I really believe in spiritual stuff, or I have some of the experiences maybe you had as a kid, but like, I've been struggling with depression on and off for five years. It's like, great. We can hold that. You're a soul. We can hold that those abilities are happening, but let's work with some of the mental health pieces, because if you don't work through those first, you're not going to trust yourself. And a lot of psychic abilities and mediumship have to do with neutrality and trust and love. And if you're struggling with those things in yourself, it really dims the other one. So it doesn't make sense to start there. And so that's why I keep them separate. So, and again, that's why you'll see it on my psychic medium sort of website. It's like, Hey, if you're really interested in this, let's go here. So a lot of the folks that I call my one book, one practice is soul essence wellness center. And the other is soul psychotherapy. psychotherapy. So it holds the soul um, as the cornerstone Mm. of what we're trying to connect back into, but in a much more slower trauma informed, and we're not trying to open up, you know, I'm not going to teach you how to do a psychic reading, right? Mm. If you're struggling with feeling enough energy to wake Mm. up and go to your job and doubting yourself, it doesn't make sense to go there. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. And I love what you said about the body as well, sort of just getting in touch with the body. And and when you said that, I feel like I need to say to people, when I was talking earlier about some of us don't have or have never experienced some things that we help other people with. Mm-hmm. Um, what, and I said, you know, I've never had a panic attack. I've never had phobia. 
but what uh, but I do know what it's like to have anxious thoughts, which is the basis of phobias and panic, mm-hmm. and to be anxious and worried. So there is, you know, you don't have to have the, the actual struggle, mm-hmm. but in the body, if the body has a rem, um, memory of helping, I, I believe, when you mention the body, that's important. If the body has that, then yes, we can help other people, I think, mm-hmm. to tap into how to uh, help that. So I thank Spirit for help for you saying that and for helping me get to my point a little bit more. So, because I don't want to sound like, oh, well, I don't have any issue. Of course I do. I've talked about this before on another podcast as well. But yes, of course, you know, we all, and I think we've become therapists uh, because we have had our own struggles with things. Um, And we do, we are able to help people through things. We may not have been through the exact thing that you've been through, but there'll be elements of that in some way in which we can, we can help people. I think if you don't have that, how can you help? How can you help somebody else? Right. Mm. Right. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. So just uh, philosophically as well, second to last question, uh, because we talk about past lives. So I love to ask this of mediums, anything spiritual if you could have, uh, I would say, dinner, lunch with three people, past, present, living, gone, who would it be? Because I always get such interesting people from mediums and psychotherapists. Who would it be and why? Oh, man. When I, one of the reasons that I felt like I was, like, one of the reasons I had a model about what was happening to me was because I loved Sylvia Brown. I really, really loved Sylvia Brown. And she, she was a psychic. She passed, I think in like 2017. Oh, was that, was that, um, was that this lady? She's American, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. She is. Was she the older lady? Um, I don't think we had her in the UK, but No, she probably did some of that. And I think you would probably actually really respect her because she was a very born skeptic, born very psychic, but was in hypnotherapy and did hundreds and thousands of hypnotherapy. And all of a sudden past lives started coming in and she would listen to these tapes over and over and people would start talking in different languages or about things. Yeah, And so she made really crazy um, connections with people in different universities where she would send them the tape and go, where did you get this? This is ancient language from Egypt. So she was almost like a scientist in her work. She would, she would always, things would come in through the hypnotherapy sort of pieces and the past lives. And then she's been everywhere. She was helping police find missing children, you know, That's more it. of the, That's it. Yeah. she would do that kind of stuff. She would, um, yeah, work one to one with people. She was very well known for being a psychic on a TV show, right? Where she could just have a crowd of people and and answer things. And she made predictions and she was also very um like she had she has these short blonde hair, kind of like a bob and like really long fingernails and this really low voice. And people always would ask her if she was a smoker, but that was just her low tone of a voice. <laughs> but she just she made she really put herself out there as an, as a psychic medium, when a lot of folks, uh, it was probably a lot of energy coming at you around skepticism. So she was one of the forerunners, I believe, in terms of going on television and starting to offer feedback to people and things. And um, she's just amazing. I love reading her books and I talked with her actually a few weeks ago. I was like, Sylvia, when are you going to be my spirit guide? (laughs) Let me give you my spirit guide. This would be really helpful for you to come in. And she was like, honey, she's like, I'm here if you got questions. Oh. So I was like, okay, okay. So I love, I love Sylvia Brown a lot. She, um, yeah, she's definitely a favorite for me. Wow. Okay. I'm going to have to look her up. So yeah. Sylvia Brown, two other yeah. people. Yeah. I would say I would sit down. I know this is probably very stereotypical, but I would love to sit down with Einstein and explain mediumship and the processes and say, how does this overlap with some of your theories about 
the universe and different sort of pieces there. I would love to sit down with someone like Einstein or even someone, I wish I knew someone that was even like a quantum physicist Mm -hmm. in this world and to sit down with them and talk about the process or even go into a channel and talk about what's happening and have us collaborate around what is happening or what sort of theories represent that, um, whether it's string theory, right. Or some of these other sort of different pieces, I would love to sit down with someone and build a bridge to sort of the mysticism sort of piece to more of the quantum level. I think that could be really cool. Yeah. Cause Einstein talked about vibration and things vibrate. So yeah, he was, he was on to things. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Anybody else? I would probably sit down. So my grandmother, I've never met her. Um, she died a couple of years before I was born, but she is just amazing. We have a really good relationship. We talk. Um, she's in a different life now. She's um, in a different body in a different country, but her soul ability for us to communicate. My mom, her and myself um, have had a lot of lives together. And I love for all of us to sit down together for her to come back into my mom and me and to sit down and be able to talk about the places that we've been because we choose lives over and over where we've known each other, we're around each other. So it just reminds me of a triangle. And I've, I talked to her in spirit and she's very much so there for me, but I would love for all of us to sit down in a lifetime together where I'm older and we can have these conversations, I think. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. That is beautiful. But you can do that can't you 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 and your mom and then you can call her in well, I can call her in I think my mom is still working on hearing and feeling I was oh. just teaching, I teach my mom a lot of stuff I just taught her how to cross people in different oh. ways too. she's drumming is really big for her and she has the ability to sense and see other spirits so we're getting there hopefully yeah. we'll be able to have something like that someday how yeah. beautiful but what a what an interesting lunch that would be I know, Einstein, wouldn't it? <laughs> Einstein, uh, Sylvia Brown, yeah. and grandmother. Yeah. Beautiful, yeah. beautiful stuff. Mm-hmm. Well, we've we've kind of come to the end. We've got so much good information from you today, so that's been really helpful. But we're going to put a fork in it. I call it far out random question. F O R Q. So I've got some. Um, questions here in a bowl so I'm just going to randomly pick one right what was the unspoken scandal in your town when growing up (laughs) the (laughs) un random in my town growing up I grew up in a very small town a very small farming community and I would say like a like scandal or maybe this is I don't know if this is the right energy but growing up in a really small town there's a lot of pride especially in a small town around the people that originated in the town um in a way especially it's a farming community and people coming in. And so the scandal always was when people were trying to change things in the town, there was a lot of trying to keep the old roots and keep things the same and people trying to come in with new ideas. And so there was this sort of scandal way of politically, um, like a lot of behind the scenes of trying to keep people in certain positions to keep certain things happening, probably the same that's happening in our government, mm-hmm. right? The, the, the thing around, we need to keep this the same and other people that are trying to come in and the kind of the networking and all of that behind the background of um, trying to keep certain people in places. So you could feel that energy of people like, oh, those are the people that have been here for a long time. And the people that are able to have this privilege or do these things versus the people coming in. And these are the people trying to ruin things. And Mm -hmm. so Mm -hmm. that was more of the, probably a microcosm of the macro level of what's happening in our society. I don't know if that's specific enough, but that's what I feel in yes. terms of the people in the town of the, the small farming community that I lived in. That is, yeah. that is scandalous. That yeah. is scan- scandalous. It's interesting. Yeah. But, you know, um, speaking of sort of just the microcosm or the macrocosm as well, um, is there something that you can say to people that will help them to live a better life? What mm-hmm. helps? To live a better life. 
And this is, again, this is more on the woo sort of link. So maybe this is more for listeners that are wanting to figure out how to tap into the soul essence, or a lot of people want to tap into more guidance. More and more people are saying, I'm supposed to have guides or guidance or people around me. And the, uh, this is really simple in a way, but the advice I would give to people is if you don't hear something, keep asking, ask anyway. If there's doubt coming up around, do I have these abilities or can I ask for these things to come in? Or I'm asking guides to come in, keep asking, keep leaning in, keep asking for things to show up for signs to show up because just by asking you create a sense of you're worthy of those things of knowing they're available and your wi-fi station starts allowing those frequencies to come in so many some of your programming starts going away a little bit so as weird as that sounds ask anyway if there's doubt if there's unsure if there's a sense of not doing it right keep asking ask anyway brilliant advice for us all for Mm -hmm. us all to remember just keep asking because so many of us out here we keep we do our spirit or whoever you could say buddha god the universe help me to do this help me to or what am i supposed to do and you feel as though you're not getting any answers so Mm -hmm. i love that keep asking Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that is brilliant sandra thank you so much it's been truly fascinating uh Mm -hmm. you obviously have such a gift for helping people and for healing people Mm -hmm. as well so i'm so pleased you stepped into your space and that's what you're doing so many people are seeking their Mm -hmm. space to step into you found yours at an early early age Mm-hmm. and stepped into it and you can help others to do it as well mm-hmm. so I just want to thank you thank you for being on the show and uh viewers listeners if you're listening on apple if you're watching on youtube thank you for joining us all of Zandra's details will be in the show notes so go and follow her on instagram uh go to her website Go to her YouTube channel and follow her. Go to her podcast and follow her on the podcast as well. Listen to her podcast as well. She does some excellent podcasts just about energy and spirituality. And, you know, she talks about different topics as well. So it's worth a listen. Go and follow her. Thank you guys for watching and listening today. And Zandra, have a great, uh, I guess, rest of the day for you. (laughs) <laughs> you're just Thank starting you so your day yeah. thank you lovely to see you blessings thanks so much for listening today make sure you subscribe and follow on all streaming platforms leave me a comment and also let me know if there's any particular topics you'd like me to discuss see you next time bye